everyone. Welcome to Wandering DMs. I'm Paul. And I'm Dan. And uh, on this Wandering DMs episode, we're going to be asking the critical question, should you read the Dungeon Master's Guide? I should say that today, Wandering DMs is brought to you by the help of our friends at Describe.com with a special offer to our viewers, but more on that later. So the Dungeon Master's Guide... Um, yeah, I the got. I, I mean, we're people of the book, right? This I, is the I whole got my, I got my, I got my. In fact, I, I have a whole oh, hand of them, Dan. I got. Uh, oh my god! See. I got this one. Oh, and I got crap. that one. <laughs> and I got. I got one of these. Oh, I got. I got. Wait. I got this. This. This one over here. Okay. Oh my god! <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready to talk but, about the oh, Dungeon Master's Guide. There have been five editions of D and D, and Paul's <laughs> holding up five Dungeon Master's Guides. Yeah, so yeah, that's yeah, that's pretty yeah. darn good. As as is um, typical for us, unfortunately, I do not have the fourth edition version here. Sorry, everyone. We are not experts in fourth edition D and D. So I believe that to, <laughs> to, to replace that, you got two first editions. I do there, have I two. I do have two first. I do have the the two first editions with both covers, the original and okay. the updated one. Uh, this uh, this is uh, here we go. Nope, this one. This is the one I grew up with. Definitely, this is the one I had as a kid. Uh, got this one later. Uh, as far as I'm aware, these are exactly the same, just with a different cover. Yes, I believe that. My, that's my understanding as well. Yeah. 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 Um, what about original D and D, right? So I mean, I mentioned this right before we started. Actually, I mean, so you know, original D and D that came in the the little brown books, right? That came in the the white box uh, has basically the same uh, separation of topics. Actually, so it comes in three booklets, and if you pull out the last one, uh, which is uh, volume three, that's not the last one. This is the last one. Uh, now it says. Oh, that is the last one. Jeez, it's my damage chair. Okay, so technically it says Volume 3, The Underworld and Wilderness Adventures, but it's basically the same kind of content that you get in Dungeon Master's Guide nowadays is how to run the game. So even from the inception, they had a separate... The, the intuition was to have a separate section just for the DMs. I mean, interestingly, Dan, you and I were kind of talking about this at the beginning uh, before we went on of, like, you know, in which cases is the text separated based on just the content, just organizationally the content versus the target audience, right? Is the is yeah. what goes in the DM's guide there because it's specifically for DMs or they needed just to split up that the content in some way? Um, before we jump into that, though, look, okay, I'm going to jump to the end. Fifth edition D and D, Dan. Here's my my fifth edition Great. DMs guild. I got my other two fifth edition. Got my my player's handbook and monster manual sitting behind me. Which book should I open, Dan, if I want to know how much XP you get for killing a CR five monster? Oh, good lord. <clears throat> okay, so every edition that I'm familiar with, you just think about this. Every edition that I'm familiar with, the answer is the DMs book, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I'll say the DMs book because that's the sensible answer. It's actually the monster manual. Oh, the monster manual! Oh, yeah, that was yeah. that was going to be the last thing I guessed. Yeah, that throws me every time. Every time really? I go, I totally do what you just said. I'm like, oh, let me get. I need to know how much XP. Let me open my dungeon master's guide. Ooh, nope, not there. It's in the monster huh. manual. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, Interestingly, funny. there is a little chunk of a chunk of rules at the beginning of the monster manual, uh, including stuff like uh, XP per CR. I don't know. Makes makes sense, I guess, to some degree. That, that you don't see CR anywhere else, right? Like this. Right. Okay. Admittedly, if you go back, right, if we compare this to earlier editions, in the older monster manuals, it, the XP would just be there, right? Like if I look at my first edition monster manual, it just gives me the number right on the entry, doesn't it? Oh, it oh, that's that's very new school, man. That's yeah. that's very <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that's for the Philistines. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so first edition, you have to look in the DM's guide uh, to look up a chart okay. Uh, okay. of uh, monsters to XP, and um, same for original D and D. That's a chart in the um, interesting. Well, well by second, okay. do, by second, do we get that? No. Okay, I know certainly BX is going to give me the right. XP in in every entry, but possibly that's because BX has like weird math for how much XP any given monster. That, no, I'm oh, going to yeah? disagree with that. Here's, oh, yeah? here's BX right here. No, no, no. They, they have, um, and, and unfortunately, it's all ripped apart because I've used it so heavily. <laughs> um, <coughs> arguably, they possibly used BX more heavily at the table than any other book. Hmm. So yeah, so they, they, don't have, they don't have XP values there. If you look at some of the entries, the title, the name of the monster will have some asterisks, and that indicates that you need right. to give yeah. you need to look at the chart. And you need to give a couple bonuses for special abilities if there's an asterisk by the name. So, 
Um, it's, it's keyed with the information, but you do have to look at a chart in the in the sort of in the dungeon masters section. Awesome. All right, so let's let's roll back. First, in original D and D, you have three booklets, right? And right. none of them are specifically targeting the dungeon. They don't say like this one is for the dungeon master, but you kind of uh, have. Yeah. But but your argument is the content in the third book is clearly for the dungeon master yeah. and not for any it's, players. It, it's, it's all the same stuff that winds up in the dungeon master's guides in later editions. Give me that. What is that? What is that stuff? Okay. Well, primarily it's it's making dungeons and and wilderness and naval and aerial uh, adventures basically. Um, so so I mean it starts off and and the very first thing is here's how you make a dungeon, and that's most of the content. Okay. Uh, the way that the way that Gary wrote it. So it's um, and it's uh, it, you know, monster encounter tables mm -hmm. for dungeons and wilderness, and then uh, other stuff you're going to find in the wilderness like a castles table, evasion rules, uh, hirelings you can hire, how to build a castle, stuff like that. Here's here's the things I would expect to find in the Dungeon Master's Guide across editions, and I'm sure it's mm -hmm. various editions will break these rules one way or the other. Is as you said, number one, advice on creating content. You're the dungeon master. Yeah. You have to create your own content. Here's advice on how to do it. Uh, number two is uh, specific rules for edge cases. So usually like the very minute stuff that would just, if you put it all in the player's handbook, it would just be too dense, right? Like how fast can I swim when I am encumbered? And maybe that's not even a good one. But very, what am I looking for? Like Like poisons or... Um, how do I hire a hireling, or yeah. maybe um, like chances to hear a noise, chances to you know how how much how much light your yeah. light yeah. is creating or things like that. Yeah, yeah, but very detailed rules that are very situationally specific. And then finally, uh, magic items. Okay, now let me let me great. Those are those are three great beats. I'll say that, so there's a couple things that changed over the editions on exactly those subjects. Mm -hmm. One, you know, as I, as I hold up the, the original little brown books, um, the one notable change in where the content is, is in initially they put the magic items in with the monsters. Interesting. So uh, volume two is labeled monsters and treasure, mm -hmm. and you get all the monsters, you get the, you know, the treasure table, you get how much the coins are worth, and you get all the magic items all here. Mm -hmm. And you can sort of see you can sort of see a, a vestigial leftover of that. Like in first edition, there's always the the treasure table at the back of the monster manual. Mm -hmm. They don't tell you what the treasures are. But the treasure table sitting in there. Um, so obviously, with first edition, they move the magic items from the monsters book into the dungeon master's book, and um, and that's where it stayed after that. You know what I find really interesting here is like all of this seems to me to come from the fact that like there's just too much for one book, right? There's too much. One book would be enormous. And yet these days, from what I hear of the business side of publishing RPG books, is that the money comes from making big, full-color, glossy books with lots of page count. That okay. like ma publishing little floppy adventure books is not really profitable, and that's why you see that stuff moving more and more into the digital realm with stuff like DMs Guild and, and our RPG now, uh, not RPG now, uh, Drive Through RPG. Okay. Okay. Um, so now that this is where the money's at, why don't they just pack it all into one giant book? I certainly have some books that are like you know the size of the three core books all piled together. It's not like they can't make that yeah. page count. Yeah. Well, okay. So, okay. So here's a little. So here's a little new feature. Actually, I'll, I'll yeah. point out that we started. That I started doing this weekend is this morning, uh, before this show, I taped uh, a patrons special benefit video. Actually, this morning with reinvited Brooklyn artist Isabella <laughs> Garbani, um, where we actually chat about this topic in advance uh, over breakfast. That we're calling the breakfast briefing and is going to be uh, released uh, for our, um, our our tier two and up patrons on Patreon, and, um, you know, I, I show, Isabel looked through the first edition DM's guide for the first time, and maybe as a, someone who doesn't, you know, DM the game, she was kind of, she was actually shocked by how long it is. Yeah. She, she, the first edition DM's guide, she was like, oh, that's, Fat book. that's too long, yeah, that's way too dense. Yeah. And I mentioned, exactly. 
Yeah, it's noticeable right too when you compare it to the first edition player's handbook, mm -hmm. which I don't have on hand here, which is quite skinny by comparison. Yeah, agreed, agreed, agreed. And I mentioned, as part of that, I mentioned the Pathfinder book, right? The Pathfinder book puts everything, and I, I, someone can tell us how many pages that is, but the last Pathfinder core rules is going to be six or 800 pages or something like that. And I think that that starts to become yeah. literally burdensome to carry around. Yep. To the extent of possibly even dangerous if you drop it on your foot. <laughs> um, and intimidating to new players. Yeah, yeah. So, I can see that. I can see that. There's probably a legacy reason, right? There's probably yeah. a legacy reason. It's ever since the very first start of it, three books. Yeah, it's always uh -huh. been three books. Um, yeah, likewise, and... we, were, we were talking about, like, is this, is this going to be solely about D&D, &D, or are we going to talk about other games and how they split up the rules? And I think there are certainly other RPGs out there that sort of say, okay, beyond this page, this is for the DM. Um, right. But I feel like it's it's rare. I don't know. I, I was trying to think of specific examples, and I was calling me up with a lot of things of, like, like Savage Worlds. The book is just the book. There's certainly stuff that's more for the DM than, than not, but it's, it's the book. I'm look at other games. Now, now yeah. like, I'm remembering Jeff Grubb's Marvel Super Heroes. Um... They, they split that up into player's book, judge's book. Um, yeah. Yeah. I got another anecdote for you here. Um, when I first got into old school gaming, um, I was, uh, you know, I, for a long time I ran BX, but before I ran BX, I ran Labyrinth Lord, which was a retro clone of BX because um, I didn't have the original BX books on hand at that time. And it was easier to come across Labyrinth, Labyrinth Lord, which came as one big PDF. Um, I was also into custom bookmaking, if you remember this. That was a little oh, brief, brief okay. period of time where uh, I experimented as a hobby of making making books. So when my Labyrinth Lord game started to take off, I made books, little books. Oh, and you beautiful. can see I split it into the player's guide and the DM's reference, and specifically because I made about six of these and one of these. Um, but these were both built. As you can see, I'm, I'm clearly aping the basic and expert set. Yeah. Um, but it is the original Labyrinth Lord text, and I've and I've kind of just broken it apart into what I thought was like this is what the players want on hand at the table, right? And it's got character right. creation, uh, spells, uh, some some the rules on movement, like like time and right. movement and light and trap detection, blah blah blah, and right. uh, basic combat, like basic combat rules are in right. here. And then the mon and then the 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 DM's reference has got. Surprise, surprise. Uh, edge Casey rules, like how to hire a retainer and yep. you know, how to check morale and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, how, to, how to do uh, adventures at sea and uh, air travel. Then it has mm -hmm. a big chunk of monsters and treasure. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. What's, that's what's in my... And that's not really the way Labyrinth Lord is printed, right? I took the PDF and I mutilated it to make these things. Okay, um, okay. But I think it, it, it found it amusing to style them as the basic and expert set because it's interesting to note that BX, of course, also comes in two sets, basic and expert. But they're not targeted at ones for players and ones for DMs. Right. Right? Agreed. Yeah. Instead, You're right. They, You're they totally split, right. They split it by content, right? You end up with, like, levels one through three is in the basic set. So some spells and some, you know... Some character stats yeah. and some inventory, and then expert set is like, oh, and and all of the wilderness stuff is in the expert set because don't worry about that for basic stuff. You're just gonna go into dungeons, and then you get levels four through fourteen in the expert set. And I think that's very interesting, right? That they that they split it that way. In some ways, that's you know that's a that's that's a following through from the Holmes basic. Um, that, uh, you know, which is a standalone um, uh, intro D&D &D set that, it, that just had, had likewise levels one through three, mm -hmm. and it's just stuff basically copied out of original D&D. &D. So levels one through three, uh, dungeon-based monsters, um, and an expectation for dungeon adventures. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, I think they were looking at that and said, let's kind of recreate this and then have a second unit that shows levels above third plus all the wilderness stuff. Yes. So I think they were very much following through on the gesture that Holmes took with his basic set. Regardless, if you look at, let's say, let's say you're evaluating which, which, 19, which era 1981 game do I want to play? Do I want to play AD&D mm -hmm. First Edition or do I want to play BX? 
right? And you're just looking at how they split the content into separate volumes. Which one do you think did right. a better job? Wow, that's like <laughs> one of my kids, dude. That's like, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I love you, all my children yeah, equally yeah. in different ways. I'll tell you what, the BX split always bothered me with how impossible it is to recombine it, right? You have, you know, like, and it even came with the books, like, pre-drilled holes, like you were going to put them right, into. It's got the holes, the holes in it. Right. It's got the holes in it. You but can you slice it up. No, you can't. You can't. It doesn't work it's, that way. Like, you, you did get, that. You get into I the know that you did that. <laughs> I did do it. And you it's totally not totally did that. I did do I did do that. And it's not great, right? Because like okay, right. like you can't alphabetize the monsters. You're gonna get you're gonna have two sections of monsters. You can't Yeah. 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 And actually I didn't do that. The book I have is literally just the red book and the blue book back to back. Right. Right. They're not uh, I didn't now, try to come say- them. Right. Yeah. The first thing that you you had a problem with there yeah. was the monsters. And yeah. as as I think we all know, the the first hardcover book, right? You know, you're coming out of original D&D was, of course, the monster manual yeah. because the hugest pain in the ass was the bits and pieces of monsters all over the place. So the very first thing that seemed to justify a hardcover book was put all the monsters in alphabetical order in one place. Yeah. Um, and that's really what, what spawned hardcover books and AD&D and all that kind of stuff off the bat. Yep, yep. So, I, I don't know. I, I'm comfortable saying I think that AD&D did a better job of splitting up the content. Um, so let's talk about like what that content is, because this is really interesting. And, and as we get through editions, I think we're going to find, you know, again, as you point out, even in OD&D, we have this surprise of like, guess what? The magic items are in with the monsters in the OD&D yeah. booklet. That's a little surprising. I bet every edition has a little surprise like that. Probably so. Um, so in OD&D, should you read the Dungeon Master's Guide? I'd say, hell yeah, it's, it's one third of the content. Like, yeah. you can't not read that book. That book's super important, I think. I, uh, I agree. It has it has dungeons. It has all the wandering monsters. And it, for me, I'll say that when I first got it, and I didn't have it my whole life. I only got it about thir- still 13, 14 years ago. Uh, the main thing that really wowed me was, oh my god, they have complete total rules for castles and naval combat and aerial combat. A complete total mini game system for each of those things in this teeny tiny little little booklet. Yeah. Uh, it's got dungeons, it's got wilderness, it's got wandering monsters, it's got castles, it's got baronies, it's got armies, it's got naval combat, it's got aerial combat. It's like, holy smoke. Um, so I was, I was personally most excited. Uh, when I got original d and I was most excited by reading the third volume for the DMs, which shocked me how much was in here. In retrospect, uh, you know, I've playtested a lot of it, and you need, to, you need to fill in a lot of stuff, and not everything there works 100% as much as the promise is there. Uh, and, you know, more recently, actually thanks to Griff Morgan, for example, we've gotten to see uh, Dave Arneson's uh, more fully formed aerial rules, and maybe that's, a, maybe that's a better system than get cut down to fit into this tiny little book. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I was most excited, when I got an od and I was most excited by that third book. Awesome. Awesome. I, I definitely like that third book. I use it, I would say, most for, like, um, random encounter charts in the wilderness. I think is in that third book, right? And that's yeah. that's a that's a go to for me. Yeah. Um, okay, let's talk about first edition AD and D because I think this is very interesting, Dan. Because I think you've told me in the past that like you used you've read this thing cover to cover many times. This was like this was like in your backpack all the time as a kid. Yeah, this was your, yeah. your favorite uh, your I, favorite book. <laughs> I didn't even have a backpack. It was literally in my hands, right? It was literally in my hands, like almost full time from age 11 to 13. And I would take it. Now, look, I'm a guy. So a couple of things about me. A, I'm a guy of the book, right? I've always been about the the text. And I was in a a rural location. I didn't have any mentor to tell me D&D. Um, I got I got the books and I was the first person to read them and I was always the person who was always teaching everybody else and I was always the DM. So that having been said, from age eleven to thirteen, yeah, it was literally in my hands at school, on the bus, in class, right? You, you know, got in trouble a couple times for that. In the, in the car, on family outings, in a restaurant, when I was going to fairs to show my my 4-H cattle. Um, it, it, all the time, and yeah, I would read it, and I would reread it, and I would reread it, and I would reread it. And of course, the the DM's guide, you know, is a lot of commentary. It's not a 
it's not mostly hard mechanics. Mm. So a lot of it is Gary Gygax writing commentary or advice to support or defend what he'd created with original D&D. Hmm. And there's stuff on, there's long treatises on medieval economics and government structure and political situations and what the feudal situation is for peasants and stuff like that. What strategies for monsters should be taken. And I just, I read that until the, the, the things are all, you know, dog-eared and I can just put my thumbnail in any particular topic in the first edition. and. It largely structured the way that I read and the way that I write. And in fact, the way that I, that I even would write in high school and early college would largely resemble what guy, you know, high guy Gaxian, some people call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've had to struggle over the years to actually dial that back. It was a little <laughs> too much. It was a little bit over rich, and I would tend to use slightly overly large words and overly complicated sentence structures and and avoid use of the word I. Like I actually would avoid, you know, I would use like the, the your distinguished author believes that thought of it. <laughs> instead of saying I think this. Yeah. And yeah. over the years I've had to dial it down to be a little bit more uh, a little bit more curt. But the, the the first edition DM's guide is the book that I've read the most in my life. Okay. By about an order of magnitude and it structured all of my vocabulary. Here's here. <laughs> on the other hand oh, yeah. you should read I, it. I've never read this cover to cover. Never once in my life. As, as a kid... <laughs> uh, as, uh, <laughs> are you coming back? Get back here, you bastard. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, so as a kid, I didn't have this book. I didn't own it. I had, and, and honestly, I was of an age where I didn't really understand the difference between basic D&D and ad and I didn't really comprehend that they were different products. So I had the basic set and the expert set, and I had... Um, I had the first edition AD&D player's handbook. And and that's it. That's the only AD&D... I know, I think I probably had the Monster Manual at some point. I think, I'm pretty sure I eventually got the Monster Manual. But I didn't have the Dungeon Master's Guide. But I thought that I had a complete game there. I, you know, and, and, and as a result, the game I played is, was this strange mishmash of basic stuff and AD&D stuff. I almost looked at it as, I think, like, like AD&D player's handbook was... Uh, was extra options on top of the basic stuff. Like here's the basic stuff and now here's some more extra complex stuff you can add to it. But the problem with that is like there's a lot missing from the first edition player's handbook, right? Some of the stuff that's in a the Dungeon Master's guide is a little surprising to us uh, compared to modern editions. For example, the attack matrices. What number do you have to roll to hit? It's not in the player's handbook. Not there at all. Here it is in the DMT. And how is it surprising? Because it's the only edition where that's where they put it. Yeah. So in uh, in original D and D, uh, sure, the the attack matrices are in the first volume, it, where, where the classes and players stuff is. It's it, it, the zeroth edition. It's in the player's book. Uh, any later edition, uh, second, third, fourth, fifth, uh, that information's in the player's book. So so historically, now the first edition does kind of st stand out like a sore thumb about it's the only one where they uniquely put the combat matrix piece in the DMs book. Yeah. Now, when I if I go back, so so when I got back into old school stuff, I I attempted to read the Dungeon Master's Guide cover to cover. I was like, I should read this. This is part of my yeah. education. I, and well, there you go. I don't know. I made it maybe halfway through before I was like, oh, just the, first of all, that writing style that you described is brutal. I just can't can't deal with it. And the other thing is, for me, it's a bit like sitting down to read an encyclopedia, right? I've always the way I use the Dungeon Master's Guide now is much more as sort of reference lookup than like casual reading, right? If you go back to that list I gave at the beginning of the things I expect to find in the DMG, situationally specific rules and magic items are both things that I'm going to want to look up one specific thing at a time, not a thing where I want to read the list of all 27,000. Um, so the only one I think that's actually interesting to read in a, in a casual way is that content creation guidance. Right. But right. but I think that's where I got really bogged down was like just going through like, okay, here's the, all of the possible um, all the possible diseases and poisons and Hey, oh, yeah. it's just like okay. I don't. Is this gonna come up in a game? I don't know. Maybe uh, I'm not retaining. You know, maybe I'm not retaining I was, the information. Yeah. Maybe I was at an impressionistic age where all <laughs> of that stuff 
felt like it was opening up possibilities to me. And so, and you know, and, and, and in hindsight, not all that stuff really paid off, but it seemed suggestive of a wider world of possibilities. And every single one of these details felt like something that was opening a door to a whole bunch of other, <laughs> other options. Um, and, and yet, um, interestingly, you mentioned that the thing you really loved about discovering the, the third booklet in OD&D is air combat and naval combat. Is that stuff not in here? Yeah. That's a longer, that's a complicated story. <laughs> sort of, yes. Okay, the okay. very shortest stuff is, yes, there are sections on aerial naval combat. However, uh, my thesis is that all of that assumes that you've got the original stuff available. And so it's been turned, I guess I blogged about this once or twice, it's been turned very abstract. Mm -hmm. So whereas in the original books, the, like the, the, the ship movement, the aerial movement is, here's how many inches, and here's, the, here's how many hex faces you can turn. Um, and here's, here's specifically 50 men on a galley and 100 men on a large galley. And when you go to advanced D&D, one of, one of my critiques about what Gary was doing there is he was trying to, he, many times he was making the systems much more abstract, trying to cover all possibilities, and as a result, you lose the concreteness of it. So the ship and aerial stuff there, like particularly the naval stuff, is, well, uh, you know, ships have a variety of number of people. They could have a few or, or very many, and they could have one or two or three masts, and here's the travel in miles per hour but i'm not doing games in miles per hour yeah um and so and i think and there's other things you know that i think that mentally he was he was like i know that i wrote down all that detail somewhere uh but it's back in original dnd yeah is where the the concrete details are so looking frank looking at the first edition uh dm's guide i was always enticed but the aerial naval rules that I was going to have to fill in a whole bunch of information. And when I grabbed original D&D, I was like, oh, wait, it was already here in the first place. <laughs> here. Yeah. I don't need to fill that. It's, it's, it was there to begin with and then removed. Yeah, interesting. So there's a little bit there, but I, you, can't, you can't actually actively game with it with the first edition stuff. That's, that's my thesis. Someone could tell me that I'm wrong. Let me go back to something, Paul, if I can. So yeah, we briefly yeah. pointed out, right, that the combat matrices are uniquely in the DM's Guide in First Edition. Mm -hmm. And we, we've asked a couple times recently, I think, well, why is that? And I know, you know, so a number of theories are floating around, and I actually asked this on, on Facebook uh, last week. And, of course, there's a number of people that will say, obviously, you have to be stupid not to realize mm -hmm. that it's reason A, and then other people are going, well, obviously it's reason B. <laughs> and other people will say, any moron can see that it's clearly reason C. Um, and those reasons vary from we want immersion, so the players shouldn't have access to it, to, uh, well, these are expansions of original D&D. You already have combat matrices in either original D&D or maybe you're using the BX book, mm -hmm. where it's perfectly fine. So you already have matrices to begin with. Mm -hmm. you, you know, we could leave them until later publications. Um, and then also, um, actually, um, Mr. Uh, Tim Cask actually piped up and said, I know the reason why. Uh, ask me, ask me some other time and I'll tell you. So I'm, I'm, per so I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> currently to say eagerly, <laughs> right, yeah. So I'm eagerly, I'm eagerly looking forward to touch base with, uh, with Mr. Cask and, uh, and see if he can, if he can resolve that. All right, make a, make a now, note. Let's I'll, get that guy on the show. Right, yeah, totally, right. <laughs> now, currently, you know, the other thing is, I, I hope we can do that, actually. The other thing is, you know, the funny thing is, of course, uh, uh, the first uh, uh, DM's guide has Gary Gygax as the author, but the foreword lists Mike Carr as the TSR games and rules editor. So perhaps the other option is we could get Mike Carr on, hopefully, and get his uh, attitude to it, or maybe get him and Cask, and then uh, have them get in a debate. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's, do, let's start <laughs> arranging this show around uh, debates between... Uh, uh, old school uh, D and D our, experts, our, our curmudgeonly friends. Yeah, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Let's do that. Um, okay. Well, yeah. Yep. Yep. Shot That's that interesting. Right I, th down. I think it's. I think it's very interesting, right? It's just. It's an interesting fact, right? And I feel like, you know, there's just whether whether you're you're very uh, adamant about believing one of those reasons or not, you see it crop up, right? You see it crop up in cases like. 
uh, Dan Harmon in, in Harmon Quest and in, in Community, his presentation is always that the DM rolls all the dice. Because he says that's the way he used to play. And is that the way he used to play because the DMG makes it appear that that's the right way to do it? Mm-hmm. Maybe. And I've seen I've recently see, seen people claim that that's clearly the 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 uber, uber way to play original D anD D. Is that clearly the books imply that the DM is rolling all the dice, including for player yeah. character generation? Uh, that that part I actually do agree. Yeah. It does actually say that. And so there are people that again say clearly the way to play is to have the DM roll all the dice. I've never I've never seen anyone do that. Yeah, uh, I've not, I've not seen that. it in practice either, except for like mm-hmm. I said those those presentations in, in mass media by by Mr. Harmon. Yeah. Um, it sounds interesting. I'd like to check it out. It might be, yeah. might be fun. I don't know. I agree. I know. It's, you know, the last couple of weeks, it's crossed my mind. I guess maybe I would like to try. And we've had conversations like this on our Discord server for patrons. Um, uh, there are some people that actually have played that way. Um, I've, I never have. And so the thought has actually crossed my mind for the first time in a couple of weeks. Just try a game where the DM's making all the rolls and all the checks uh, and the players just have to believe what I say. Yeah, I, don't, I have no idea. I've never seen it. I, I'm actually kind of skeptical, but I feel like I should run the experiment. Yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting. It'd be interesting. So, should you read the first edition AD and D Dungeon Master's Guide? We all agree <laughs> that the answer is clearly yes, and the only question is how many times should you read it? And I'm Great. arguing for at least five. My my but argument is. But we all agree the number is at least two or higher. I my my argument would be zero. So we'll see you next week <laughs> on one or uh, But I would I would qualify that with saying you should own it. You should own it. And and the way I. And again, it, should you read it? For me, it just comes down to, well, how do you read it? Are you going to sit down uh, of an evening and make your way through another 50 pages? I don't think so. But should you have it on hand so that when you're, something comes up in your game and you go, wait, you know, how, um, how exactly does morale work and when am I supposed to check it? You can go flip to page 67 and find out. You know, I feel like... Okay, so if you if you if you, if you're I I just can't believe there's so many Philistines that are in my in my friend circle, um, but I feel like you know reading the um, at least read the couple pages on like monster strategies. Nice, I can't find yeah, that there is. you go. Like I feel like like that gives a view of what uh, yeah here is so monsters and organizations like pages 104 105 like like i think that in particular gives a view of how gary expects the rules to be used and a whole lot of w- what you would expect the npcs to act like real people and have a variety of responses depending on organization level and iq Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like that maybe at least that's the first entry point that I would take of things that I thought was very very rich that I didn't get to that level of detail in yeah. later edition. Yeah, I think that is a really interesting topic. If you're looking for that same information in your fifth edition game, maybe go check out the book "The Monsters Know What They're Doing" by our friend Keith Amon, mm-hmm. which I think also digs into that same that same topic, uh, but then drills down into it per monster. Um, and of course, we had an interview with Keith uh, in season two, so maybe go yeah, back and uh, yeah. look at Wandering DM season two for an interview with Keith. And hoping, you know, he has a new book coming out uh, this fall, if I believe. I think it's called More, M O A R, uh, More Monsters Know What They're Doing, I think, this fall. So hopefully oh, we can get nice. Keith back to talk yeah. about that. Yeah, that'd uh, be great. When that comes out. That's great. Um, excellent, excellent. So, uh, shall, we, shall we press on? Second edition? Second edition, great. Yeah, yeah. So second edition, uh, you know, came out after uh, Gary uh, Gygax uh, uh, departed from TSR, and it was edited by uh, David Zeb Cook, uh, wonderful designer. Now, and it's interesting because uh, Dave Cook uh, has has edited, done a second edition for uh, for something Gary done twice, right? So obviously, Dave is listed as the author of the expert book, the Blue Book, for BX. Mm-hmm. Where he redid the level four to fourteen stuff from original D and D, and Dave Cook also wrote the DM's guide for second edition AD and D. So he's he's reinterpreted Gygaxian stuff twice. Hmm. Um, a very talented designer had dinner with him a while back, and I have signed copies of some of his adventures. 
Uh, to my understanding, the, the mission statement for second edition was that he had to keep everything compatible with first edition adventures. So the overall mechanics couldn't change. The overall structure of the spells couldn't change, is my understanding. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And for my taste, I feel that, you know, second edition doesn't feel as visceral to me because, again, it got a little bit more abstract. Mm -hmm. So it shaved off a lot of the pointy bits. It shaved off, you know, we all know they shaved off demons and devils because that was not appropriate at the time. Right. Um, shaved off, you know, subjects of dark evil and things like that. And I, the the thing I, I personally have trouble with second edition is a lot of places where they don't give you a a, um, a specific rule. They go, you know, leveling up, you could do it like this, or you could do it like this. Make something up. And I'm personally kind of left at sea without a core rule, and I'm kind of not fond of the, you could do it like this, or you could do it like this, gentle suggestion hmm. tactic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I also did not read this thing, um, and I will say it felt even less important in second edition because so much more made it into the player's handbook. I feel like in, by second edition they had edited up the player's handbook to contain a lot of the rules um, that, that you needed to run the game, and so what yep. was in here was really again like no again did I did I own it? Sure, I owned it, and did I use it as a reference material? Absolutely, especially. The magic items, right? That's the one thing I remember pulling this book out for a lot was to look up magic yeah. items. Yeah. Um, but that starts around page, I don't know, 1, 1, 120, 130 so. And uh, you know, I don't know. So that's 130 ish pages of stuff that I never read. Okay. You know, observation that I maybe I should have said before mm -hmm. is that there's, there's a clever thing that they, they've done with the publishing since first edition is I think most of us would agree that there's three obvious areas in D&D to expand the system. And those three areas are spells, monsters, and magic items, right? Mm -hmm. Now, in original D&D, again, two of those three things were in one book, right? They had the monsters and the treasures in one book. Mm -hmm. um, and so have, by, by taking the magic items and moving it to the DM's guide, they've cleverly put the three areas for expansion, three different books. So the player's book gets the spells, mm. the monster's get, book gets the monsters, obviously, and then the DM's guide has the magic items that you were just talking about. So they've cleverly put those pieces of content in three separate books. Um, in the last week, I was thinking about, like, you know, and this is something that you said a couple weeks back, Paul, of, like, do you even really need physical books anymore? And I was starting to think about, you know, maybe if you free yourself from that model, maybe you could have one book of core rules, right? Mm -hmm. One very slim book of just like, here's how you run the game, kabam. And then maybe separate like a wiki with, here's our growing list of spells, and here's our growing list of monsters, and here's our growing list of magic items. And you can just pull that up digitally for the expansion stuff, keep it growing, um, and not need that stuff in actual physical books, but actually have one starter core rules volume that springboards you to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess um, I would. I, I suspect um, modern players that springboard may be watching an actual play, like Critical Role or something. Okay, I've, I've witnessed a game. I now know, understand the basics of how it runs, and then you can you can wikiify your rules as well. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, it, right. Maybe I mean maybe that that initial thing was also online. Because I'll tell you what, um, more often than not, now when I'm running a game, especially fifth edition game, especially because it's COVID and I'm doing it from a computer, uh, when a rules question comes up, I don't grab a book. Generally, I grab a browser yeah. and I do a search. Right. And sometimes I search right in in uh, <clears throat> uh, D and D Beyond. It's yeah. got it's reasonably well indexed, but sometimes I just search Google, and 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 a lot of times the answer comes up not in any of the three books, but rather in some tweets that were made by the game designers. Really, where they're qualifying? Yikes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. For example, Dan, uh, does the spell? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, for does, God's sake! Here we go. For Chrome's does, sake, does the spell Liam and Tiny Hut? Have a bottom, or is it just a, okay, a dome? 
I think it was, I believe it was Stu. Okay, so Stu's yeah. currently watching this episode. So actually, I, I, Stu has, uh, Stu Rat has helped me be clarify this because I didn't know this until I looked it up based on his critique is, okay, so, so currently Jeremy Crawford is claiming that the language says, yes, it has a floor because it says it's a hemisphere. Yeah. But I agree with Stu that mathematically the word hemisphere does not imply a floor. So Crawford's saying yes for uh, a really uh, uh, unjustified reasons. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Stu, you can tell me whether that you agree with that synopsis or not, but that's, 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 where, that's, where I, that's my understanding currently. There you go, there you go. Yeah, but that's, I don't know. I feel like a lot of times, you know, it's, it's search that is, that is bringing me answers to, to the hard D&D &D questions, not, not rifling through one of these books anymore. Yeah. I'll say that when I, you know, and I would not have gotten to that point uh, if, again, if it weren't for COVID and if it weren't for online games. Yep. When yep. we were running The Big Bad, uh, I actually always had Roll20 up. Yeah. I always had Roll20 up, and I was always doing my searches there, and I found that actually to be among the best organized uh, resources for 5th edition stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, do you want to talk about third? I, I do want to talk about third. So, you know, you and I played quite a bit of third edition D&D. &D. Uh, we started a campaign with second edition, only played it for a couple months, and I was, I was like, I was gnashing my teeth, frankly. I was the last one to agree to play second edition. But I'm like, all right, and that's what everybody else wants. A couple months came out, and then third edition was published, and we, we flipped the third edition pretty eagerly, played that for at least seven or eight years, I think. And, you know, I'm going to praise third edition. Now, of course, third edition, the, 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 the credit, uh, the top credit for the, the DMG D&D &D design team is listed as Monty Cook, Jonathan Tweet, Skip Williams. And I'll just point out that uh, as a, we're going to have Jonathan Tweet on as a special guest next week. So Great. we can cycle back next Sunday and we can ask one of the, uh, one of the primary third edition designers, namely Jonathan Tweet, about his experience with that. Uh, in addition to, and he was also the the lead designer of uh, D and D miniatures at the time too, the, their war game product. Excellent. And I'm looking Excellent. personally looking forward to asking about that. Uh, Monty Cook uh, was then listed as the the D Dungeon Master's Guide Design. Uh, so Monty Cook kind of has individual mm -hmm. pullout status there. And I'm going to say among the things that Third Edition really clarified for me was that they did a good job of making explicit the difference between a core rule and a variant rule. And they very nicely labeled things that were variant possibility rules mm -hmm. and also mm -hmm. sidebar behind the screen motivation why the rule is what it is. And that is not something that Gygax did in first edition. Yep. Um, and, I, and now I realize that there's a bunch of stuff in first edition like weapon speeds, uh, uh, weapon armor adjustments, that Gary himself didn't use and actually thought was ridiculous, <clears throat> but was writing for fan service, apparently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and, and now, as someone, as a literalist, if it's in the book for first edition growing up, and that's actually why, part of why I read the DMG over and over again, is I had to memorize all the rules. These <laughs> are the rules, they're in the book, this is the game. You know, and at the time, Gary was writing stuff to that extent, that these are the rules, and so I was literally trying to memorize all of them. Yeah. And now I know that that's really not the essence, the soul of the game, uh, and that there's a lot of stuff in there that is more, um, you know, more flexible, even from the designer's aspect. And it was honestly, it was third edition that really opened my mind up to that. Hmm. By, by making that stuff explicit in sidebars and labeling those variants, it, fi it actually, for the first time, got me to think about, oh, what, what, which of these options should I actually tune to make myself happy with the game? Mm -hmm. And that's what put me on a path of, of making a game that's much more my own after that. And that I really have to thank uh, Monty and Jonathan uh, and Skip very much for, for developing stuff in third edition like that. Awesome. Awesome. That helped me a lot. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So it sounds like, once again, Dan's on the side of, you should read this book. Oh, it made such a difference for me. It made <laughs> such a difference for me. Yeah. There's one massive screw-up. There's one enormous, huge, massive screw-up in the third edition DMG that uh, Monty himself has, has uh, 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 apologized for later on, felt and, and wished he, he hadn't made that mistake. Do you, know, do you know what I'm about to say, Paul? No, no. What is it? N near the end, right, almost the last page of the DMG, 
at the end of the magic items, there's an a la carte table of magic item design. Uh -huh. And it's like, you want these abilities, yep. right? A first level spell, da 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 da, -da. And with, a, with an a la carte cost mechanism, and it's not labeled as a variant. It's not labeled as a variant. Um, and so, and, you know, the player's guide has, you mentioned, I think this last, the other week or so, has crafting rules that specifically say, you've got to go look at the DM's guide to see what the options are. Yep. So, you know, it's already, players have already been pointed at that section. There's an a la carte pricing list that's not labeled as a variant, and a lot of people thought that was a core rule, and players had a guaranteed right to make an infinite healing ring for 50 gold pieces. <laughs> and everybody said, was like, oh, I'm so clever. I've made a Cure Light Wounds ring that works every round for 50 gold pieces. Aren't I clever? And yep. uh, Monty said, yeah, man, I look at that table, and I really wish I hadn't put that there because it <laughs> caused all kinds of trouble. Yep, I definitely. But remember. if he just labeled it variant, like he yep. did everything else, yeah. that would have led less of a problem. I definitely remember that running rough shot over our own third edition yeah. game. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, if you're running three, uh, DM's guide I think is very useful. Um, you know, the interesting thing I think is um, by the time we were playing third, and this is really more about me than about the the text here. Um, like sections about like how to design content, I probably you know was flipped through that really quickly and didn't really read that because by that point I'm like I'm thinking I've been playing D and D a long time now I know how to make content I know how to make a dungeon that's fun I know how to make an interesting wilderness encounter I don't need you dungeon master's guide to tell me how to do it and I think only now that we are sort of taking this more academic look is it interesting me to say like well but what did the third edition designers think? And how is that different from yeah. what the second edition or the first edition designers thought? Um, and that's where it gets really interesting to me to just put it in the context of who was writing and when and what the, the ideals of the game were at that time because they have changed, right? The presentation, unfortunately, of the books is always, this is the right way, right? <laughs> this is how you do it. You don't know how to do it. Here it is. Here's how you do it. Um, and I think it's interesting to, to, to think about, like, yeah, but that's a, that's a changing, shifting thing. And I would say, you know, I would say that even that's varied. I mean, you know, I would point out second edition is the one that's the most loosey-goosey. Like, he, yeah. you, can, you can rarely nail down Zeb in second edition with any particular prescription. It's frequently, hey, you could do like this, you could do like this. You could pick like this, you could do like that. You want to do this? I don't know. Maybe. You could do that. Um, so I find the second edition DMG to be very loosey-goosey on that, actually. On, um, on guidance on how to create content? Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now, I haven't read... Okay, did, I haven't read it super recently, but I feel <laughs> like that's my, that's my impression of the second edition DMG. My gut tells me that, like, every DM who's thought critically about it has their own ideas on how to create good content. <clears throat> and that... And that it, any book that's that's going to lay it out, DM Guide or otherwise, you really have to take with a grain of salt. And it's interesting, you might get some good ideas, but I would never right. read them as like a prescriptive, this is the recipe for how to make a dungeon. Do steps one, two, three, done. Well, I, I understood the word read in there, but I didn't understand <laughs> most of the rest of that sentence. I... <laughs> <laughs> All right, I mean, we, we're, we got 10 minutes left, so I'm going to jump back to 5th edition at the end here. Please do. Um, so the interesting thing for me about 5th edition, have I read the 5th edition Dungeon Master's Guide? Absolutely not. Never read it. I, why do I even own it? I don't know. Um, but you're a famous DM. You're a famous, <laughs> you're a famous internet DM and referee, Paul. I've seen you in the shirt. How could that be? <laughs> this thing, I think, gets even looser in terms of, like... Um, it really is, like, you talk about 2nd edition being loosey-goosey. I think 5th edition is very, very loosey-goosey of, like, it's all variant. Like, I would read every section in this as if it was variant. And almost all the sections, if I just read you off the chapter list, you have a world of your own, creating a multiverse, creating adventures, creating non-player characters, adventure environments, between adventures. Ah, here we go, chapter 7, treasure. There's that I was looking for. There's okay. some hardcore rules. Magic items are in here. But generally, it reads to me really m much about, like, advice. And I think the, the biggest thing that underscores this for me is the back of the book. This, I think, is really fascinating. 
you look at the back of the book of, of first edition AD&D Dungeon Master's Guide, it says, all the information you need to referee your advanced Dungeons & Dragons game is in this book. Second edition tells us, this is the complete guide to being an AD&D game Dungeon Master. Whether you're running a single adventure or masterminding complete fantasy campaign, Dungeon Master's Guide is an absolute necessity. By third, we have, you've got the Dungeons & Dragons Player's Handbook, but you need more! You're the Dungeon Master, and it's up to you to create adventures for your worlds and your friends' characters to experience, explore, and conquer. This book contains everything you need, from special high-level classes to magic items, artifacts, and more. So far, very consistent. This is everything you need to run to be a DM. Here's our 5th edition blurb. The Dungeon Master's Guide provides the inspiration and guidance you need to spark your imagination and create worlds of adventure for your players to explore and enjoy. Inside you'll find world building advice, tips and tricks for creating memorable dungeons and adventures, optional game rules, hundreds of classic D&D magic items, and many other tools to help you be a great Dungeon Master. Do you need this? What? What a great observation. I'm so <laughs> glad you noticed that. That's great. What a, what a great contrast. It really is shocking, huh. I think, by the time you get to 5th edition. It, this is yeah. a, a copy for every other one. is like, you need this book. It has the rules in it. And 5th edition is like, hey, here's some advice. <laughs> here's some inspiration. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That wow. feels like a real shift to me. Now I want to now I want to know what the blurb on the end of fourth is to see where that hmm. where that elusive when shift that, occurred. Yeah. Um, wow, that's boy. I'm gonna that's gonna stick with me actually. Now I'm gonna like <laughs> and which one is better? Like I don't now I'm like, you know, and I can see a tension like with the whole yeah. like where's the combat matrices, where's the magic items. I can see this tension of like we want to put something super important in this book, so you got to buy it. Versus, like, we want the super important stuff to be known to everybody, so we're going to put it in the player's book. Yep. Um, and I can see that as a, as a, as a publication strategy uh, dilemma. Yep. But, um, wow. Yeah, I feel like the only thing that 5th that edition has really retained in terms of that, like, hardcore, you need this, is the list of magic yeah. items. Yeah. Right? Like, Which you and I are now looking up online all the time. Yep. Yep. So other than that, I don't know. I don't know. And more and more, I feel like in, in the 5th edition era, especially because 5th edition has had such a long reign, I think that's interesting to note of, like, how long was it the current edition? I think 5th is probably mm -hmm. at, way out in the in the lead there, a number of right. years. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you get more and more ancillary books and stuff like like uh, our friend Keith Amon's book on, on how to run monsters. Like, you get more and more of these add-on books and books that, that are just full of advice and whatnot. And I feel like the Dungeon Master's Guide has just sort of become another one of those books. Interesting. For Interesting. me. This is my huh. personal opinion. I might be totally wrong. But, um, yeah, I think... And, for, you know, again, for me, you know, you say Dungeon Master's Guide and what I, you know, mentally am like, I'm thinking first edition and I'm thinking... The, the 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 clarion call of of Gygax's voice is what I get. It's like yeah. here's what the game's about, and here's the sensibility that it rises from, and here's the voice of of a DM. Uh, and to me, it, it very I, I almost think think D and D, and frankly, of any book at all, I think first edition DM's guide and uh, my games and my speaking style and my writing style wouldn't remotely be the same if I hadn't. Um, poured over that particular tome. I will say this, um, and this is something we both, here's a point that Dan and I totally agreed on at the very beginning uh, before we started streaming, is that the DM's guide is chock full of that delightful, nostalgic smell of my childhood. <laughs> oh man, do I love the way these books smell. There's something unique about yeah. the first edition D&D books. They yeah. all have that unique yeah. smell. That yeah. just immediately slams me in the face with said yeah. memory. Uh, yeah, smells my, like my childhood. My... I'm just kind of. I'm just gonna get another good whiff in here. Yeah, yeah, please do. Ah, oh, that's good stuff. <laughs> Mine's gone. I mean, my my. Yeah. I mean, I I read I read the scent right out of my book. I read and I, and I had it in. You know, like I say, restaurants and fairs and cattle trucks and cars and beaches. Um, and I I'm pretty sure I read the scent right out of my book. So I might have to go pick up a secondhand copy. Um, that wasn't used so much in order to get the scent back. Yeah, I got, I got to give a, uh, uh, a, a shout out, I think, to Dan Hoffaker. If anyone knows Dan Hoffaker, thank you for taking such good care of your Dungeon Master's Guide 
and then reselling it somewhere such that it ended up in my hands because I did not take good care of things as a child and I had to rebuy all my books. Great. Great. I love that. I love the shout out. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thanks, Dan. That's fantastic. <laughs> so we are closing in on the end here, Dan. What's uh, you got that? Can you? Got any conclusions to make here? Should you read the Dungeon Master's Guide? What do you think? I mean, I might be biased because it was the most formative thing that I ever read of any type whatsoever. So I might be biased. Uh, it definitely um, shaped my brain. It shaped, mm -hmm. it shaped a large proportion of the neurons in my brain. Um, so for me, you know, it's hard, you know, and not having learned from a mentor, um, I have a hard time even conceiving D&D without reading specifically Gygax's first edition DMG. So to me, it feels like a necessity. Hmm. Um, and I'm glad that I've convinced all of you today of that fact. <laughs> I, I still don't, I don't think to be a good DM, you have to read it. Um, I think it's interesting and you should consider reading it. If you're a scholar of D&D, &D, uh, definitely go. You, you should read everything you can get your hands on, to be honest. Um, but uh, I definitely over the years have seen it more and more as um, reference material, right? It's like, for me, it's like the encyclopedia. Am I going to read the whole encyclopedia cover to cover? No, I'm not. But maybe I'll have it on hand so that I can look stuff up as, as necessary. Awesome. Boy, that observation with how the, what the blurb on the back of the 5th edition yeah, book is, yeah, that is, yeah. that is a great, really yeah. great find. To, to be awesome. fair, to, I will have to think about that very hard later. Later on, my my approach is makes me far more likely to miss interesting details and then uh, require on clever folks like Dan Collins to tell me. But did you know on this such and such page of the Dungeon Master's Guide? Oh, I didn't realize that. I'm gonna go read that. But section. you know what? It's nice <laughs> to have those surprises available. And yeah. you know, I'm around home here, and sometimes I forget about stuff in daily life, and I'm like. Like, oh my God! I bought cookies earlier today. That's great. I forgot all about that. I'm so, I'm so wonderful to have that surprise. So you know, it's nice to have, it's, it's nice to have those surprises still waiting for you. Those little details, and I don't mind being able to dig into the book and still being able to be surprised by the the crazy unexpected stuff that they put in there once in a yeah. while. So awesome. that's not bad either. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, viewers, if you have uh, comments or thoughts about what can be found or should be found in the Dungeon Master's Guide, uh, leave some comments here in the YouTube video. Um, if you specifically have questions you want to make sure that we pose to Jonathan Tweet when he's on the show, uh, uh, you know, as regards 3rd edition Dungeon Master's Guide or any of his other works, you can leave those there as well. Uh, we would appreciate that. And while you're there, maybe take a quick look at the included link in the description of the video to our sponsors, Describe. That is D-S-C-R-Y-B dot com slash wandering. Uh, check that out to see uh, our sponsors, Describe. Then, then who's Describe? What do they do? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that, Paul. Uh, Describe, of course, are purveyors of finely crafted box text. They have professional authors writing uh, explanatory, uh, fancy, descriptive texts for all the things that are expansions in your game, frankly. So things like new spells or new monsters or new magic items or locations that are showing up for the first time in your adventure. And so they're there to uh, save uh, prep time for the, the busy DM who doesn't have time to read everything, um, who needs, needs help like that. And they have a search <laughs> system uh, that allows you to look up new stuff on the fly for when your players go off the rails, which we are highly in favor of here at Wandering the M's. Mm. Um, so, and of course, if you um, uh, make a new order there at uh, um, uh, Describe.com, you'll get, uh, and put, on the, put in the code Wandering, you'll get 10% off your order. Awesome. Thanks so much, Describe, for sponsoring the show. We appreciate it. There'll be a link in the description uh, yeah. on YouTube uh, after we're done with the show, of course. Uh, and remember that uh, you can, if you're new to the show, you can, of course, like and follow, subscribe to us, The Wandering DMs, on uh, media sites such as YouTube and Twitch. Maybe you're watching there today. And Twitter and Facebook and GitHub. And we do have the handle Wandering DMs on all of those sites. If you'd prefer to listen to our show in audio-only podcast format, that is available on our website at wanderingdms.com and through various carriers such as Google Podcast and iTunes and Spotify. We're admittedly a little behind in getting those podcasts, audio-only podcasts out. I apologize for that, but uh, we actually have a whole batch of them about to go out, so you're going to see those real soon. Um, so, so yeah, you can listen to our uh, glorious voices uh, there. 
And if you are listening to us on one of those alternate carriers of podcasts, please take a moment to rate and review us there. That helps other Wandering DMs uh, fans find us, and uh, we appreciate it. Well, it, it, we, we very much do appreciate it. And, of course, uh, enormous thanks to our very generous patrons uh, who support uh, all the shows here on the Wandering DMs channel. Uh, we uh, really appreciate your, your help so very much. Um, if you uh, are in a place where you can possibly join them in supporting Wandering DMs, please do go to patreon.com slash wandering DMs. Uh, uh, pick a tier that's appropriate for you, of course, and you'll get benefits such as a uh, private Discord server, and we always continue the chat uh, after the show actually live face-to-face uh, -face with our patrons there. We'll be doing that uh, right after we wrap up the show today. Um, uh, I run polls every month on uh, what topic you want to see on my blog at uh, Delta's D&D. Uh, new thing we've started up, giving the patrons an opportunity to pick the armies that I and Isabel use in the war game Saturday nights, uh, the patrons pick. Uh, for the Book of War war game, and then also this morning we filled a filmed a breakfast briefing with me and Isabel talking about this uh, particular DMG subject matter. So if you'd like to get a third opinion on it, uh, become a patron and uh, check out Patreon.com for a uh, uh, private uh, uh, patrons-only video expanding on this particular topic. A whole bunch of stuff like that. If you're a patron, I, I really look forward to talking to our patrons right after the show about the Dungeon Master's Guide. I suspect there will be a lot of opinions to be heard. So, oh, well, forward. mostly just one, because I think I was pretty <laughs> persuasive today. I think I was pretty persuasive, William and Joshua and Stu and everybody else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Underline that, please. Now, before, before we wrap up, i got to say, we have so many great, uh, wonderful guests uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks. I'm personally really excited about this. Uh, you heard me mention earlier, next week, in one week, uh, next Sunday, February 28th, we will have Mr. Jonathan Tweed on. Uh, and again, he was uh, the primer, one of the primary designers of third edition D&D. So we're looking forward to asking him next week about how the third edition game and Dungeon Master's Guide came together. He was also the lead designer on the recreation of uh, uh, the Chainmail War Game, uh, which became D&D Miniatures. Uh, and I'm using, I'm using some of the D&D miniatures last night on our live war game show, so I want to ask him about that. And he also has a Kickstarter going right now for his um, really revolutionary role-playing game Everway that he first made back in the 90s. And so we're looking forward to seeing what he's done with the Everway game. One week after that, which will be March 7th, we will have on Mr. Luke Gygax. And, uh, of course, Luke is organizing the annual Gary Con, which will be online uh, last week of March. So March 7th, we're looking forward to uh, Luke about... Um, uh, so I'm, I know I'm going on a little sorry, long here, sorry. Paul, but you've got to bear with me here because I feel itchy, it's important. Itchy trigger finger there on the credits. So we'll, have, we'll have Luke Gygax on to talk about growing up in the Gygax household and the evolution of Gary's voice and the evolution of D&D and what's happening at GaryCon, which, we should, which has so many great events and we should all uh, go participate in GaryCon uh, the, last, uh, the last week of March. Uh, so, and, and other guests, right? Other guests. And so I better, I better yeah. not tell you yeah. about the other guests because apparently Paul's going to cut me off. Okay, here You'll we go. Have to wait another go week and here, I'll Dan. tell you then. But <laughs> get ready for questions for people like Jonathan Tweed and Luke Gygax and other folks in upcoming weeks. So excited about that. Uh, look for 10 Dead Rats on Thursday. Look for another Book of War on Saturday. And don't forget, we're always here Sundays, 1 p.m. Eastern time. So please join us next week with Mr. Jonathan Tweet for another thought-provoking discussion. We'll see you then. Oh, am I supposed to play the credits now? No? Please! Oh, okay. <laughs>